But two points um, on this. First of all, it was in previous litigation that EPIC pursued against the Department of Homeland Security under the Freedom of Information Act uh, that we were able to obtain the technical specifications and the vendor contracts uh, concerning the devices. So we actually know quite a lot about the technology. And we know, in fact, that the devices are designed, designed, required, and I need to underscore this because the TSA is very reluctant to admit it. They required that the vendors design the devices so that images could be stored and recorded. It is in the device specifications. It could be now, evidence later now on. What, well, yes, it is, <laughs> it is our Exhibit A. <laughs> um, now, what happened subsequently, when the political debate blew up, they said, oh, of course, uh, we've disabled this functionality. We wouldn't do this. This is something the vendors have done. We're not interested in this. On and on they went. But we knew from the origins of the technology where this capability emerged. The vendors didn't do this on their own. This was the requirement, the technical specification of the device, which I think um, you know, is one point that we need to keep in mind. Now, another point that we need to keep in mind as we have this discussion is, are these devices effective? Yes? I mean, there's a powerful argument, no doubt, um, that you know, we would much rather s sort of go through a box that we don't understand than to be touched in an intrusive way, which we are naturally repel against. I mean, I think this is obvious in some ways. And to some extent, by the way, I would suggest that security officials play on this in trying to put forward these uh, proposals. Uh, but what if I were to tell you that, in fact, these devices are not effective at detecting the kind of explosives uh, that have been used recently on December 25th by Abdul Matalab or by the shoe bomber Reed, uh, because in both instances, they actually used a powdered explosive called PETN. And the powdered explosive is easy to conceal. It's not readily detected by either backscatter X-ray or millimeter wave. So we have a public that says, oh, we accept this program. This is less intrusive. It makes us safe. At least that's what we're told. What is the objection? Well, I think there's a lot of objection. Alan, you are suspiciously quiet about this. What, what is your preference uh, between the two options of body scan or physical scan? I'm just enjoying the tennis match here <laughs> enormously. And since I believe between, a little you might bit of Mark and a little bit of Ruth, I'm quite content to let the two of them send the ball back and forth. When you get to another subject, you, you might You might be it. hit. You know, it's dangerous. <laughs> Net in the, in, the, in the middle. So uh, uh, an another Perhaps a case study of, of religion, which also we've discussed earlier, uh, taken from the Israeli context. Uh, women, religious women in Israel, Muslim and presumably also uh, Orthodox Jews, who objected to their photograph taken and included in the national ID, which we've had for ages, uh, were exempt. A woman could say, I am religious. This uh, uh, harms or violates or infringes on my religious beliefs. I wish to uh, not to be. Um, I wish that my photograph is not included in the ID. Over the last couple of years, we have the biometric law, biometric database, which is still under a pilot, whatever that is, and it has been discussed and debated uh, yesterday and, uh, and earlier today uh, in the in the plenary panel. That biometric law cancelled, abolished the exemption. So religious women, now their photographs will be taken in a biometric, biometric way, so it can be uh, coded and decoded and, and uh, used later on. And the religion is simply sort of deleted from the list of considerations of this uh, issue. So as an outsider or outsiders, uh, to the Israeli debate, but this can come up in, in various other uh, societies. What would you say to those women and to the government? I think at some point when you talk about reasonableness, you have to decide whether an objection defeats a, a significant social and political value which is more important or paramount. Uh, the French are struggling with this in terms of uh, religious women who want to obscure their faces almost completely and yet still go into public buildings or uh, go into places where quite significant security issues are involved. 
So I guess in this particular case, I would opt for the requirement that, that they must be photographed. You always have the problem, don't you, that in order to protect one social interest, you may have to decide that it's vital to intrude into another interest. So my example of anti-discrimination and privacy relationship, this is the opposite side. We're saying that we will penetrate your desire to be treated differently because in this case, the need for adequate security is more important than our recognition of your difference. So hard as it is, that, that's where I would come down. Ruth? I want to make this point a bit larger. I noticed that in our tag, uh, we have Hebrew, Arabic, English. and English, and French. Yep. And in at least the three languages they understand, two of them are privacy weak, privacy weak. And the third is, excuse my accent, semaine vie privée. Vie privée is not privacy. Vie privée is private life. Private life is very different from privacy. Now, private life is anonymity. And we used to be a society in all the world in which people did not have to bear their faces in public. They had the freedom to only bear their faces in private, in their homes. Now, in Western culture, we don't need that because we don't have these cultural norms. But in many Muslim countries, these cultural norms are still prevalent. Now, when these cultural norms are prevalent, women, when they go outside, cover their face. Actually, they have to cover their face because of their religious mandate. I mean, this is required of them. And in their particular societies, this is required. Now, in our societies, before security, it still would have been very interesting what we would have done. In France, it's not necessarily security. In France, it's identity. It's the laïté, it's the secularity of the state and it's the dignity of women, which is obviously very controversial, who defines what the dignity of women is. And I think this does raise a very important question about the relationship between privacy and religion. Because it also involves the relationship between a, a person and their community. What about the women who are Muslim and do not want to cover their faces? Do we, in terms of human rights, force their societies to let them not cover their faces? Very, very big debate. Probably the answer is, I don't know what, but it's not enforced. But the other thing is, when Muslims live within Western society, are they allowed to maintain their culture? Another cultural right. It's not really privacy, but it's you know, autonomy, cultural rights. Big issue. And I would think that part of this problem is the changing norms and the culture dependence of privacy norms. And when we are dealing with a globalized situation of immigration and such, part of our concern with privacy is to see the complexity. It's not only security versus the need not to be identified, where I agree with Alan. But I don't think it's the whole problem or even the more interesting part of the problem and there, I think theory will be indispensable, Mark. Because the right of group rights versus individual rights, exit rights, and cultural space in which you can still be a member of your community but negotiate norms of the outer community are very, very serious problem of the age. I don't know that they are connected to the protection of data or to information, which supports my view that privacy is more than fair information practices. Gentlemen? Um, well, I agree, by the way. Privacy is more than fair information practices, but that just turns out to be an enormously helpful uh, concept. Um, and I think, Michael, what your question points to, and it, it, is, it is a bit um, you know, grounded in U.S. law, of course, when we talk about uh, privacy in the U.S., sometimes we're also looking at uh, religious claims, uh, whether it's uh, concealing identity, whether it's uh, objecting to providing a social security number, which is an issue that U.S. Uh, 
courts have heard and in some circumstances ruled favorably on because people hold sincere religious belief uh, that they don't want to be enumerated. Uh, but Ruth made another point which I thought was worth talking just a moment about as well, and that is the very important role that anonymity uh, plays. It is, as, as Alan said, one of those instrumental values. I mean, it enables uh, the speech of, of the dissident, for example, uh, when a person's identity is not disclosed and therefore they don't face repercussion uh, from the state. We had a case, in fact, we did a, a, an amicus brief uh, this year for an organization that was fairly unpopular among most of our, my friends anyway, but nonetheless we thought it was an important principle. Uh, it was a, a, a group that objected uh, to gay marriage and they sought through state referendum to put forward a petition uh, essentially to uh, prohibit gay marriage and the question that arose uh, by those who favored gay marriage was whether the names of the petition signers should be available under the State Freedom of Information Act. And uh, we sided uh, with the people who had supported this petition. Uh, we said in effect they had um, a right to be anonymous um, and that this fundamental right was, was greater in this instance than, than the state uh, open government uh, law, and we oftentimes, by the way, argue in, in favor of this right, right to be anonymous. And people said, oh, this is ridiculous, of course. You know, someone signs a petition, you know, they're, they're standing there. I mean, you sort of know what their views are anyway. What's the big deal? And I said, well, I think the big deal is the importance of the secret ballot and the foundation of democracy, which is the freedom for people to express a political opinion and not have to account to the government or to someone else. Now, of course, the the court ended up drawing a distinction in this case and said, well, no, it's not quite the secret ballot where we would recognize, in effect, a right to be anonymous. It's something less than that. But you see the very close connection uh, between a, a state petition, for example, on a referendum and the exercise of, you know, one of the most fundamental rights, the right to engage in political life. But, you know, that, that's a fascinating case because, you know, uh, approaching a court and petitioning for uh, something that will inflict others' rights if, if there's a right to gay marriage, that's obviously the question, uh, also a substantive question there, is different than just expressing one's opinion, which can be done anonymously, or just thinking everyone can think whatever he or she wants. Um, so, so That argument was made, by the way, it was the legal effects argument. So Yeah, so... We are, we are approaching the end of our time, so it's time for concluding comments and uh, a futuristic, perhaps, uh, look, but any other comments more than welcome. There was a session a couple of days ago that gave what I thought was one of the most amusing lines of any conference I've been to. A, a man was asked whether he thought a certain privacy policy would be adopted by data protection commissioners in the future. And his answer was, well, you know, prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> I was very glad to hear that you're working on something that's looking for where things will be 20 or 30 years from now. It is hard to predict the future. The, the, there's a whole group of us and uh, those who are engaged in the technological forecasting. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also waiting to see what they will come up with. So, uh, I do think that... Uh, the privacy by design idea that's been talked about very much here is a very useful technique for engaging all the players in the world of the internet and mobile communications and all those other future oriented technologies to start at the beginning and say how can we design systems in a way that we identify risks anticipate what those risks will be design elements that avoid the risk or minimize the risk and make that the launch rather than to launch it first to make the business plan really work and then worry about the privacy issues and uh, corrective, et cetera. Um, that's a mentality which if we really could make that penetrate the world of organizations and connect it to the advocacy groups that then would be the verifiers that the privacy by design function is being carried out. That seems to me a very, very promising approach. Um, it's theoretical in the sense that it says if you can do it at the beginning, it's a lot cheaper and a lot more effective than if you try to correct things later. Uh, that's a piece of theory that I think is going to be central to privacy protection in the future. Ruth? 
concluding remarks, please? I, t I took the privilege of uh, not really working on privacy for many years now. You so should be back. <laughs> More than well. So, so uh, uh, I, 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 I'm very impressed uh, with the level of coordination and, and uh, thinking that is put into privacy issues by so many people. I uh, was very impressed at seeing that at work uh, when people were struggling here against the new biometric law, and I was impressed with the quality and the uh, uh, kind of people who were involved in this public uh, debate it succeeded only uh, uh, in a qualified manner but on the whole I think that privacy is one of the issues in which international cooperation and uh, the concerted thinking of people who are developing the technology and people who are using the technology and I think these efforts because of many reasons do in many times work together, which I agree is, is critical to, to succeeding in striking an acceptable balance uh, uh, between uh, the challenge and the promise of, of, uh, of the new technologies and the new advances. I do want to repeat that because this is now being globalized, we need to think both about the quickness in the immediacy of transferring information, but also on the very important persisting differences, cultural, religious, in norms that are critical to our concern in the field of privacy and how to navigate this, I don't know, the gap between the differences and the fact that the communities want to maintain these differences and the globalized possibilities of disseminated uh, information. Well, I think I'll make a somewhat bold statement. Um, I'd like to propose that privacy will be one of the defining political issues of the 21st century. And I think that's nothing more than to recognize um, that in our information society, uh, privacy has become the central claim of the consumer, of the citizen, of the user, and of the individual. Um, I don't know, you know, what, what the future will hold. Um, but I do have a sense that over time, um, these issues um, will become more paramount. There will be more uh, public engagement, um, more political debate. Um, and in some ways, maybe that's a good thing. Because you see, in one critical respect, privacy has changed um, in 30 years. It is no longer discussion just among elites and academics. Um, it's a discussion that engages the public, and that is um, something that gives me hope. Well, it's uh, three minutes uh, past uh, 2.30, and it's time to uh, thank, and please join me in thanking our wonderful giants of privacy. Thank you so much.